So now um, I'm delighted to invite, um, to introduce Professor Nicholas Taylor. So Nick is a professor of allied health, which is a joint appointment between La Trobe University and Eastern Health. Um, Nick's research focuses on improving rehabilitation outcomes by evaluating exercise and physical activity interventions and investigating the best way to deliver health services in rehabilitation. But he's going to talk about this um, fabulous program that he's been one of the instrumental people in establishing. And the title of Nick's talk is um, Stepping into Research, as you can see here, Stepping into Research in Al Allied Health. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Kathy, for that introduction, and thank you to the Academy for the invitation to speak. So I'm going to share three short stories about how I stepped into research, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the messages which I think arise from those stories. So it starts a while back, back in the early 1980s, when I was a young physiotherapist. I was working in a general hospital on a medical ward rotation, and I think I had a bit of an existential crisis because I was there with a patient with a pulmonary condition. Airways clearance is really important for these patients. And at that stage, one of the techniques we used was called percussion. What it really involved was standing there and hitting people on their chest wall. And you might be thinking, why would you do that? Well, there what? because at the time, I think what I, I remember thinking really vividly, what is the point? Why am I doing this? I don't buy the rationale that bashing someone on their chest wall can help to loosen secretions inside their lungs to make it easier for them to clear them. I thought I've got to do something. I've either got to leave this profession that I'm just joining or I really got to ask some questions about what works and what doesn't work. So essentially I was asking uh, a question about is percussion a worthwhile technique to help clear airways in people with pulmonary conditions. There's been a body of work which essentially in systematic reviews which just says that uh, generally it doesn't seem to make much difference and my, it's not my area and I know there are people on the panel who've got content expertise but my understanding is it's a technique that is now rarely if ever used but maybe they can correct me on that. But I guess it was a pivotal moment because it really made me think about uh, questioning what we do in our practice as an allied health clinician. My second story is about my first paper, my first publication. And this is when I was working as a clinician, again, in a hospital in the outpatient department. And at that stage, in the, when, when I did, when I collected the data for the study in the late 1980s, the leaders in the physiotherapy profession, the ones who'd done further qualifications at that stage, in the, and the leaders were people who'd done postgraduate training in manual therapy. And it was kind of like, it was seen as almost the, the pinnacle of the career, and it was seen to be the most prestigious part of practice was doing manual therapy uh, techniques, which required uh, skill and backed up by uh, a whole body of theory. So, and I sort of thought that was so, because in my practice, I seem to have patients when I, I, I attribute them getting better due to my superior manual handling skills. So I set out to investigate that as a clinician, um, just on my own and in, in a hospital. And I, was, and I was really asking, does passive joint mobilization aid return of active movement of the wrist following cast removal after colleagues fracture, that is wrist fracture. And so it was done as a controlled trial, and we're looking at comparing exercise advice and passive joint mobilizing compared to the comparison group for exercise advice and an equivalent time period spent of soft tissue massage. Now there was, I do remember vividly that the senior in my department refused to be a therapist in this study because she said she wasn't gonna waste time holding hands with patients for five minutes who'd been allocated to the comparison group. Anyway, what did we find in that study? We found there was, it was, it was set up as a superiority trial. I was sort of hypothesizing that the people getting manual therapy would go better. And this would be a really good way to tell others about um, the, the, the benefits of this physiotherapy technique. 
what we found was that in fact, there was absolutely no difference between the groups. So certainly routinely doing passage mobilizing after for people recovering from Collie's fracture made no difference compared to doing soft tissue massage. That was sort of interesting because, and it showed to me at the time, the power of research because it was really powerful to me because it changed my view. I was really sold on the benefits of manual therapy. Even when I was doing uh, joint interventions, I thought it was manual therapy that was working. And this to me changed my view that oh, perhaps it wasn't, perhaps that, perhaps that technique, technique alone isn't enough to make adaptive changes to tissues. The other thing, a couple of other things about that first paper was that um, when I presented it at a department meeting, afterwards, a senior um, academic in manual therapy came up to me and said, this must never be published because it could be seen to be negative to the profession. And I had a real reaction to that. I thought, that is just, that is just so wrong. And it helped get me over my procrastination and getting to the stage of getting it published and eventually did, got, did get published. And the other thing that those of you with an eagle eye might see is that my co-author was Kim Bunnell, who at that stage was a clinician. This before Kim had gone into research. And for those you know now, Kim is a stellar researcher with an international career uh, and international knowledge for her work in osteoarthritis. So I um, worked with Kim to get to the stage of getting it published. So that's my second story. My third story, fast forwarding to the 2000s, still a fair while ago, isn't it? Um, here, that's me back in the 2000s, a little bit younger, still no hair. And um, this is Karen Dodd. This is 2000s. This is at the stage after I'd enrolled and completed a PhD. And, one, and Karen, who was a pediatric, at this stage I was working at the university as a, a tutor, a junior lecturer. And Karen Dodd, had, who's the pediatrics lecturer in our department, had also recently completed her PhD. Anyway, we were having coffee one day and Karen was just talking about her area and pediatrics. And she's saying, it really annoys me how we're told that for young people with cerebral palsy, you shouldn't do resistance training because it'll increase their spasticity. She said, I don't know that I've ever seen any evidence, but it's like this shibble that's something we're told is really important. So just from that coffee conversation, and, and we said, well, why don't we look into it? So we start, we read that we do a systematic review. And I guess the over, our overall question for our research for that review and what followed is what is the effect of resistance exercise on activity in young people with cerebral palsy? And from that coffee conversation, that collaboration, led to 36 joint author publications, three PhD completions, and the first NH and MRC project grant that had been awarded in my department, in my university. And perhaps it also contributed to that body of work, contributed a little bit to knowledge and a little bit to change of practice. And certainly the, it might have contributed a little bit to the idea, debunking the idea that people with um, neurological with, with neurological conditions shouldn't do resistant, resistance training. The other thing too, I do remember about the NH and MRC project grant, which is a natural sort of culmination of our body of work that we we're working on that. And uh, a senior colleague said to me, what are, you, what are you working on that for? You know, you'll never get funded. So it was just interesting. So I was kind of, and sometimes, and it was just kind of really interesting that that didn't put me off. So, they're my three stories. What are the three messages arising from those stories? I think the first one is that it always comes back to the question in research. And you might've noticed that on each of my stories, I had a color coded slide about the question, which about the population, the intervention and the outcome. So we're all familiar with the PICO format. It's a way of sort of guiding us to clarify our research question in this case for intervention studies. Um, and I think it's so important. In my current role as Professor of Allied Health, 
and I'm talking to clinicians who've got a research idea, um, what the discussion always comes down to is clarifying what the research question is and making sure you've got a question and you're passionate about asking a question and finding out the answer and, and being clear about what the question is. So the question, really important. Second key message is the importance of collaboration and building relationships in your research. So here I am pictured with some of the people I work with at the moment at Eastern Health, Amy Dennett, Catherine, Holding, uh, Catherine Harding and uh, Annie Lewis. And one of the things that's about collaboration and working together with others is that A, it's fun. We kind of look happy there. So we enjoy working with each other, but also more importantly, that the sum with working with people who you like working with, the sum is greater than the parts. So I think the collaboration is really important. There is a flip side to that too. I remember years ago going to a presentation from an OT researcher from America who was towards the end of her career. And her take, one of the things, I, the one thing I remember, the saying was the one thing in a broad American accent, the one thing she learned in her career, research career was not to work with icky people. So I think uh, collaboration is really important. And the third message is about having a clear vision. So that sort of sounds straightforward, but I think what I mean by that is it's important to stick to your guns. If you're really clear about what your research question and what you're aiming to do, then don't get spooked by naysayers, really stick to your guns. And I talked about the example um, you know, for example, this person who said you'll never get funded or the person who said this must never be published. And thankfully, at those stages, I had, the, you know, I kind of knew that that was wrong and I had a clear vision about what I wanted to do. There's another part of that, though, about this is not getting spooked by people external to you. I think also important not to get spooked from your internal voice. Um, even this morning, if I can share a fourth story. Um, this morning, I got a review back from a systematic review that I've been working on with a student. And the review was, you know, it was quite, it was a bit critical. Major revision, so the door's still open, so that's good. But um, the review is essentially questioning some of the research methods of the systematic review. And I've published a lot of systematic reviews. I teach systematic review courses. And there was a little voice in my side of my head, which has been going through last night and this morning saying, ah, oh, maybe you're not really up to it. Maybe you don't know what you're doing. And you know, I think we all have that sort of internal voice sometimes, and it's important to see it for what it is. And this is not to, the, the, the feedback we got in the review is important. You don't ignore it, take it on board, and we're gonna think about how we can make our systematic review better, but not to, not to get spooked by that. And so not to get spooked by um, uh, people to external to you, and also by your own internal voice. So uh, my, three my three messages are have a clear question, uh, make sure that you collaborate, coffee is important, good researchers are never too busy to have coffee, to chat, and things just happen when you have coffee that are important for research, and also stick to your guns and have a clear vision. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Nick. There's so many stories there for people to work with and, and very relatable. And that the serendipity, those, I mean, it's a shame. You can't really be a researcher if you don't drink coffee, right? But those serendipitous conversations um, are re really magic. And, I, and the thing about don't work with icky people <laughs> is a wonderful piece of advice. <laughs> In fact, to work with someone, I think there's a criterion in position descriptions about be nice um, and, and listen, not listening to that internal voice when it's being a bit of a naysayer. But Nick, thank you very much. And we'll, we'll hold the questions until the panel. But very wise talk. Thank you.